All right, I'll start off with a few announcements. Um, welcome to our September general meeting of the East Bay Astronomical Society. Um, we have a great talk planned for you tonight. And uh, just a few things, a few uh, items of business. Um, as you know, uh, the Shabo Space and Science Center is uh, focused right now on virtual events. And they have several events uh, every week. And you should check out the Shabo Space and Science Center website and their Facebook page in order to get a full listing of their schedule. Uh, also, Gerald and I are continuing to do our Saturday night virtual telescope viewing uh, from Nelly at uh, nine o'clock at night. So we uh, hook up a camera to the 36 inch, hope for the best, uh, hope that the weather clears enough, hope that the humidity stays down, hope that the seeing is decent and um, maybe have an opportunity to show you something. And uh, we've been doing that every week. It's very, you know, people are, are pretty happy with it and uh, it seems to be popular. Um, and we have a lot of fun, uh, which is the most important thing. Um, I also wanted to mention that if you're thinking about making a donation to Chapeau, now is a very good time. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to help out the institution as much as possible, and uh, they have a lot of plans for uh, the reopening uh, uh, first quarter of next year, and uh, hopefully we'll be starting up with some small events uh, for, you know, private events anyway, uh, a little bit later in the fall. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is our friends at the Tri-Valley uh, astronomers uh, had kind of a disaster uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, the firestorm that was raging on the far side of Mount Hamilton uh, uh, took out their uh, observatory and they lost their 17 inch uh, uh, reflector telescope and the AP 1200 mount that we had helped them uh, obtain. Uh, and basically nothing's left except uh, three counterweights, uh, a pile of ash and some melted aluminum. And it, it's quite, quite spectacular actually uh, on how hot and uh, thorough that fire was. Uh, the good news, uh, there is always a silver lining. The good news is that their second observatory, which is about 50 feet away, uh, uh, which is a dome uh, containing John Westfall's uh, uh, old uh, C-14 telescope and the Paramount, uh, was completely unscathed. In fact, the grass around the observatory was still intact and it didn't get too hot and everything worked uh, when they got up to the site the other day. But what I'm gonna be doing is sending a a link out for the uh, to the membership uh, for their fundraising effort uh, to rebuild the observatory. Uh, they've got a, a crowdsource uh, event going on right now, and I thought some of you who have friends in the Tri Valley Club might be interested in helping them out, and uh, we appreciate it if you do that. Uh, that's about it. Uh, Dave Rodriguez, are you there? Hello, Dave. There, I had to unmute and. Uh unvideo myself or un no, un re video yourself re video <laughs> yes <laughs> um, well nice much. to see you and nice uh you. Hi guys yeah and i'm going to turn uh i'm going to turn the uh, introductions over to you Okay, and uh, we'll be doing this the same way. Uh, once we uh, reach the end of uh, our guest's talk tonight, um, I'll field questions and um, from both Facebook and from uh, our uh, Zoom presentation. And uh, uh, we'll go from there. Rich, one other thing. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'd like to put in a pitch for next month's speaker as well. But I'm, I don't okay. want to do, you know. That would be fine. Uh, one thing I do want to say is I'd like to second Rich's Suggestion about us all trying to help out our colleagues at Digger Pines, uh, pardon me, Tri-Valley Stargazers, their sites at Digger Pines. It's a wonderful location. Uh, one of my fun memories is seeing Omega Centauri from that location in May uh, once with the, uh, the people there. Yes, you can indeed see Omega Centauri from the Bay Area. Um, and it's a great location. It's arguably the, the darkest sky location in the Bay Area that you can easily get to. And uh, they richly deserve our help. And so thank you very much for your kind words about them, Rich. I very much appreciate that. Um, so anyway, without any further ado, I'd like to move on to tonight's speaker. Uh, we have a wonderful talk in store for you tonight by Dan. I'm, I'm forgive me, his, he's got an umlaut in his name, so I'm tempted to do the German umlaut, uh, Dan Kohler. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I think he pronounces his last name Kaler, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, because, you know, you have to make compromises for dumb Americans anyway. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, Dan has a, had a remarkable career. And, um, you know, he's one of those people that I call a professional amateur astronomer. If you folks know what I mean, we were just talking about Scott Roberts. And uh, there's, there's a number of you folks out there. And Dan is definitely one of them. Um, he's, uh, he's done so much. I mean, his his Vita is like a, a page and a half, uh, a yard and a half long, but I'd like to just hit some of the highlights. Uh, and that is that uh, among other things, he was the advertising sales manager for Astronomy Magazine from 1995 to 2002. And he was the executive producer for that wonderful program that was on PBS, 400 Years of the Telescope, which I think we all remember. And uh, it was just a, a great program. And then again, he also did the uh, the associated program, Two Small Pieces of Glass uh, for the Planetarium program, which uh, uh, I did a long time ago. Uh, so the, uh, Dan, thank you very much for that. That was an absolutely wonderful program. Uh, and, uh, but again, Dan's real passion, as you're about to find out tonight, is that wonderful grand dam of astronomy, Yerkes Observatory. Uh, and Dan, I have to have horrible admission to make, I have never made it to Yerkes, but I promise to go before I die. It's on my bucket list. And I remember as a child looking at the picture of this enormous refractor there going, wow! What an incredible instrument. And uh, of course, it was uh, associated with the University of Chicago and some remarkable astronomers, among whom is uh, Dr. Helen Pillens. Uh, uh, a number of us are the winners of the Dr. Helen Pillens Award. And uh, I hope Dan can work in a little bit of mention of her as well. I remember her at our old meetings way back in the 60s, a remarkable person. But there's a bunch of other remarkable people associated with Yerkes Observatory. And Dan is working on a book about the founding uh, and the history of Yerkes, and I happen to know uh, quite a bit about it myself, and it's a remarkable story, and Dan, I wish you the best. Um, and uh, Dan, do you want to tell us what the title of your book is going to be? Uh, the title of the, the working title right now, and I think the final title, is going to be Noble Instrument, and I'll tell you a little bit about the reason um, that's, a, that's a very special title. Um, and uh, it, was, it was chosen for a very special reason. So. Uh, hopefully toward the end of the talk, um, I'll bring that up at that time. Thank you very much. And so without any further ado, Dan, I hand it off to you. Well, thank you very much, Dave. And this is really um, quite interesting for me to be involved uh, in, uh, let's see. You guys all seeing that, by the way? Yes, it looks okay. perfect. We got it's it. perfect, okay. Um, Quite interesting for me because I've actually never done a webinar before. I've been participant in one many, many times. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and we are doing classes this fall, some of them in person, and two of my courses are uh, webinar based. We did that last year or last spring after uh, spring break uh, too. Um, so I got used to using Zoom and, and all of that, but I've actually never used it uh, to give a presentation. So. Uh, this is going to be a little bit interesting. Anyway, we'll get started here. Um, Dave, you're not alone. I'm sure there's quite a few people on the webinar today to, that uh, have never visited Yerkes uh, before, and hopefully next year uh, in 2021, you will have the opportunity to start doing that again. I want to stop uh, for just a moment and talk a bit about um, how I came to be involved with Yerkes, because I think um, it's a little bit of an inspirational story for people who are volunteers uh, and people who you might uh, be trying to solicit to become a volunteer, because that's exactly how I started uh, at Yerkes in the 1980s. I was very active beginning in 1982 with the Milwaukee Astronomical Society. By the way, I'm talking to you tonight from uh, Waukesha, uh, Wisconsin, so I'm two hours uh, ahead of you right now. Um, but uh, I was a, a longtime member of the Milwaukee Astronomical Society. I was an officer, a uh, member of the board of directors, and so on. In the middle 1980s, we were asked uh, by the staff of Yerkes uh, for some volunteer help to assist with uh, a program that they called the CARA program, which was actually the Center for Astrophysical Research in Antarctica. Um, it was a, uh, the establishment of a infrared telescope at the South Pole. Uh, that was done with NSF money, and for those of you who are familiar with NSF grants, usually the NSF asks you to give something back uh, to the community because you're using taxpayer dollars. So their give back on that program was to teach inner city youth in the city of Chicago 
um, astronomy. And that program ran all year long. It was also affiliated, I think at one point, well, it was the University of Chicago, uh, which owned Yerkes at that time. Uh, and I think there was also some affiliation with the Adler Planetarium in Chicago as well. So the kids would come up, um, this was how it was supposed to work anyway. Uh, the kids would come up on a Sunday with their parents. Uh, we would do, uh, the, <clears throat> the members of the Astronomical Society did a star party for them. It was always done the week of the Perseid meteor shower. Whether that was a full moon or a new moon or whatever moon it was, uh, they always stuck to that week. And uh, we would teach the kids how to use and teach parents to a certain extent how to use telescopes and show them what they were all about. During the week, uh, the kids had to pick a constellation. They had to pick an object within the constellation um, and study that uh, in detail. And these are um, kids who would not have had any type of um, exposure to astronomy any other way. And they got to work pretty much one-on-one -on -one with professional astronomers for about maybe 25 or 30 kids all together uh, each summer uh, in that program. So uh, the idea was we would teach kids how to use telescopes. They would um, use them during the week. And when they came, when their parents came back to pick them up at the end of the week, uh, they would show their, their parents exactly what they learned. It was a terrific program. It ran for many years. Uh, it became something called the Space Explorers Program after the CARA program folded um, some years ago. But it uh, continues on actually today. Um, even though Yerkes isn't open uh, right now, uh, they are still doing that program down uh, in Chicago. So that's how I got involved with Yerkes as a volunteer. Then I became a little bit interested in the history um, of the observatory. My first visit there was in 1975 in March uh, as a uh, physics student in high school. I was a senior that year. My physics teacher taught a lot of astronomy, took uh, a few of us to Yerkes on a Saturday in March. That was my first exposure to the refractor, to the building, and so on. And then I wound up uh, going to one of the University of Wisconsin campuses at Whitewater, which is only about 25 miles from the observatory. So I made somewhat frequent visits um, as a college student uh, to Yerkes. Then I kind of forgot about it for a while. Then I came back to it again. Uh, and uh, th when I came back to it, it was pretty much full bore. And we did, um, I did quite a bit of work uh, in research uh, as a volunteer. And then I was um, asked in 1992, uh, with the knowledge that I had gained to fill in for the full-time tour guide, uh, Richard Dreiser, who is, uh, pretty synonymous with Yerkes, actually. He worked there for nearly 40 years um, in various capacities, but he was the first full-time uh, tour guide. Interestingly enough, I started working for him in 1992. By 2015, uh, the, the roles had reversed and he was actually working for me uh, because I became the uh, Director of Tours and Special Programs at Yerkes. So my responsibilities grew. I always had another profession, um, doing something else, usually in business, because uh, I wanted to make money. But um, I always had a part-time job at Yerkes uh, helping with uh, Saturday tours, primarily when our public tours were held in those days, and then also for special programs that were held during the week. Some years I worked quite a bit, some years I didn't work all that much, uh, but in 2010 I was asked to take over the 24-inch uh, uh, observing programs for the, for the general public uh, and expand on those which eventually led to a full-time position in 2015. Now, most of you know probably that on October 1st, 2018, the University of Chicago decided to close Yerkes uh, to public access. That eliminated my job. So for the last two years, I have not had access. After having access to the observatory for 27 years, I have not been able to set foot inside the building uh, for the last two years. I do hope to have a role in the new organization uh, starting next year sometime, but we'll find, I'll find out uh, in the future, in the not too distant future, if and when uh, any of that will come to pass. But I do hope to come back um, to Yerkes at some point. Over the years, I've spent a tremendous amount of time. Um, I'm uh, very detail oriented and when I wanna learn something, I generally try to do my very best to learn absolutely everything I possibly can. And the thing about Yerkes is it will take us down many different paths. And you'll see that tonight as I go through some of the slides. Uh, I decided a couple years ago to go back to school. Um, I'm 63 years old, decided to go back and get another master's degree. I have an MBA from Marquette University in Milwaukee. I decided to go back to UW-Milwaukee uh, and start a degree in history, an MA in history. 
and emphasize public history, which is basically what I did uh, at Yerkes. And so as a public historian in training, I'm gonna use a little bit uh, of what I've learned uh, in tonight's presentation. Public historians are charged with the responsibility of actually making history relevant uh, to the people uh, that they are working with. So we will try uh, to make that as relevant to those of you in the Bay Area. And I know we've got listeners, people participating um, from all across the country tonight. Uh, but my remarks uh, tonight are basically tuned to the Bay Area um, and some of the uh, tie-ins that we can make between Yerkes and Lick, uh, for example, uh, between uh, Yerkes and the University of California, uh, between Yerkes and uh, Mount Wilson uh, and Caltech and all kind of, and Palomar and uh, all of the venerable uh, astronomical institutions in the great state of California. So without uh, going on any further on that, I want to talk very briefly about the picture that you're looking at here. This is a view of uh, Yerkes from the south looking north. Um, and it, uh, is, these are some professional shots that I had done in 2017. They were all used for uh, marketing purposes because we did a lot of marketing work uh, in getting our visitorship uh, increased at Yerkes uh, in those days. So I wanna point out a few things. On the right hand side, uh, in the foreground is uh, what, what we refer to as the South Dome, and the South Dome houses the 41-inch Warner and Swayze Reflecting Telescope. That's the very last uh, Warner and Swayze telescope uh, ever built that was installed in 1968. Behind that, just peeking above um, the flat roof of the observatory is the home of the 24-inch Bowler and Shivens 24-inch uh, telescope. That's the one that I used uh, extensively for public observing. The front dome, the one, in, uh, the one in the foreground is 30 feet in diameter, the one in back is 26 feet in diameter, so they are not exactly uh, the same size. The one in the foreground is uh, important from a historical standpoint. That's where George Willis Ritchie installed 20, uh, 24-inch, it was essentially a Newtonian 24-inch telescope shortly after Yerkes opened. He ground the mirror in the basement at Yerkes. Uh, and install that telescope. And I often refer to that as the great, 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 great grandfather of all the big reflecting telescopes that are used professionally in the world today. Um, it was uh, our first observatory director, um, George Ellery Hale, who uh, asked Richie to work on that particular project um, and uh, try to start proving that reflecting telescopes were much superior to refracting telescopes. Now backing up just slightly, um, Hale made a trip uh, this, uh, for his honeymoon in 1890 to the Lick Observatory. It had only been open for a couple of years at that point. That's where he started to fall in love with big refractors. He kind of fell out of love with big refractors toward the end of that century. And by the beginning of the 20th century, he had tuned, turned almost all of his attention to big reflectors. He felt that that was the future of astronomy, and of course, he was absolutely correct and built the 60 inch, the 100 inch, and eventually the 200 inch telescopes in California. But they all derive um, their ancestry back to that 24 inch that was in that uh, dome uh, in the south. The front dome, the one on the north side that you can't see very well in this picture, originally housed the Kenwood refractor, a 12 inch Brashear refractor that came up from Chicago. That was Hale's personal telescope. We actually still have that instrument. It's in pieces right now. Uh, the lenses are in the optics lab in the basement. There's a visual and a photographic lens for that telescope. The tube is in pieces underneath the elevator floor in the big dome uh, by the 40 inch refractor. And the, um, uh, the mount for that telescope, it's off the picture here. It would be off to the left. There's a, what we refer to as the south building. There's a couple of little domes there um, and it is uh, resting on top of that uh, mount right now is a, um, uh, well now it's an antique uh, Schmidt uh, camera. So that, uh, we still have the pieces for that and uh, the hope is to eventually reassemble the Kenwood refractor, um, uh, potentially, hopefully on, on the Yerkes grounds. But the main area of interest in this picture is off to the left and that's the 90 foot dome, 112 feet tall uh, in total from uh, base to top of dome. Still one of the largest astronomical domes ever built. 
Um, and that is housing, of course, the 40 inch uh, great refractor uh, telescope, which we will talk more about and we'll see more pictures. In between are the offices. Um, that building is 375 feet long. It is actually three stories in height. It's kind of hard to tell from that picture, but it has a full basement. Uh, it's exposed basement across the bottom, the main floor. And then there is a full second floor where you see those porthole windows. It's a full second floor above that. What I like to point out is uh, the celestial sphere right over the uh, great arch uh, there. From this vantage point, Polaris appears every night directly over uh, that celestial sphere. The other thing about Yerkes is that the building is mostly symmetrical. Um, it isn't perfectly symmetrical, but what you see on this side, on the south side, is repeated on the north side as well. Designed by Henry Ives Cobb, very famous Chicago architect um, in the classic, uh, Richardson Romanesque style. So he was very heavily influenced by a fellow named Henry Hobson Richardson, who introduced Romanesque architecture to the United States around 1870. He was a Bostonian. Um, Cobb was a Bostonian as well. They both uh, came basically from Brookline, Massachusetts. And uh, Cobb settled in Chicago, had a very prolific architectural business there. He had 120 associates at one point in time. And he designed 16 buildings for the original brand new University of Chicago campus beginning in 1890. It was completed in 1892. Charles Yerkes hired him, commissioned him to do this uh, design. Um, on campus, everything is done in an English Gothic style. Here, we're looking at a classic uh, Romanesque style. Heavy use of arches, uh, lots of terracotta uh, throughout the building, and just that heavy uh, overall uh, 19th century Romanesque uh, style of architecture. We'll take a closer look at that uh, in a little bit. All right, so I should be able to use my arrow here and keep going through the pictures. Um, this is a little bit of a close up. You can see the University of Chicago, uh, uh, Yerkes Observatory, University of Chicago. There is no uh, plan to have any of that tiling replaced uh, at this point, as far as I know, um, it will, that will stay exactly the way it is there. You see that celestial sphere with the ecliptic uh, wrapping around it, showing all 12 uh, zodiacal constellations, uh, the columns supporting uh, the arch uh, and so on. So it's just a little bit um, uh, of a better close-up picture taken the same day uh, as the other one. Now, some of the tie-ins that I wanna do have to do with an article. Uh, some of you are, are longtime amateurs, and uh, like I am, and you might recall, if you think way back, uh, in Sky and Telescope, there was an article called the Wisconsin-California Axis of Astronomy. And basically, uh, it was an exchange, it's an article about the exchange of astronomers between my state and your state, uh, between the University of Wisconsin and the University of California, between Yerkes uh, and Lick, uh, Yerkes and Mount Wilson and Yerkes and Palomar uh, as well. Um, but this is Edward Holden. Uh, many of you know, recognize his picture. Um, Edward Holden was uh, the director of the Washburn Observatory, which is on the campus of the University of Wisconsin in Madison uh, for a few years in the 1880s. Um, became president of the University of California. So he moved out to Northern California in 1885 and then magically became uh, the first director of Lick Observatory in 1888, probably also are aware of the fact that uh, his tenure uh, was marked by um, a number of disputes, one of which a uh, very famous dispute with uh, Edward Emerson Barnard, who eventually landed uh, at Yerkes. There is the axis coming back our direction. Um, so he went from Lick to Yerkes. Um, Holden was uh, quite a dictator, uh, as uh, all accounts are given and uh, lasted about 10 years uh, as uh, director of the Lick Observatory. But that's one of the first connections between uh, your state and mine uh, is Edward Holden, who was here in Wisconsin and then went out uh, to California to be director of Lick. Another one is James Keeler. He would have been number two director at Lick. Uh, Keeler was a very good friend of uh, Hales, of uh, George Ellery Hales. Uh, and he gave the dedicatory address at Yerkes on October 21st of 1897. Um, Don Osterbrock Brock wrote a wonderful uh, biography of, of James Keeler uh, some years ago. Uh, Don and I uh, knew each other fairly well because we were both researchers in, in 
much the same way and running along the same same lines and Don was a wonderful person. As you know, Don, um, you may not realize that he was a graduate student under Otto Struve at Yerkes uh, and then eventually became director at Lick and uh, also taught at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and unfortunately, you probably also know that he suffered a massive heart attack one day uh, walking across campus and died. Um, I think that was in 2006, but I'm not exactly sure of the year. Um, he was returned to Wisconsin and he's uh, buried not far from Yerkes, uh, as a matter of fact. But James Keeler um, had a great but very short career. He died at the age of 40 uh, in 1900, very short career at, at Lick. But is best known, he's known for a number of things, but in my mind, best known for resurrecting the Crossley reflector and doing all those wonderful images at Lick Observatory uh, of nebulae and uh, the, the uh, pictures and publications that he did. Um, so he had a great uh, storied but very short uh, career. There's another connection between Lick uh, and the picture of Don Asterbrock, which I mentioned here. Uh, sadly, mystery, she was a, he was a great friend of Yerkes. He wrote um, the, uh, the other book about Yerkes uh, that was done uh, for the centennial in 1997. It's called The Birth, uh, Near Death, and Resur um, what was it? The uh, I have the book here in my, in, um, just I can't think of the name of the uh, uh, the title now, but anyway, um, he uh, talks about Hale founding the observatory, um, Edwin Brand Frost, uh, who took over, uh, being almost the death of Yerkes, and then uh, uh, Yerkes being resurrected by Otto Struve starting in 1932. So uh, he was also director, as I mentioned, too, uh, one of the former directors of the Lick Observatory. Uh, Edward Barnard, who became a very famous astronomer at Williams Bay at, at the Yerkes Observatory, began his career at Lick. Um, many people, I think, don't realize he was really not a professional astronomer. He was not edgy. He was self-educated, like many of us are, um, in the science of astronomy. He's referred to, in fact, in, at the University of Chicago when he was uh, hired to work at Yerkes in uh, 1895, became um, uh, an astronomer, a practical astronomer, and that's actually what I refer to myself as, someone who uh, teaches astronomy, works in astronomy without the benefit of a degree, and that's exactly the way Barnard uh, operated. Wonderfully known for uh, terrific photographs of the Milky Way, uh, the two-volume set, which goes for thousands of dollars now, uh, was a limited edition. I think there were 500 sets of those made, uh, done posthumously. <clears throat> he died in 1923, He's also the only person to ever have a funeral at Gerkes. He was uh, actually laid out there on display and then his body was shipped back to Vanderbilt uh, where he, uh, in uh, Nashville where he was uh, buried next to his wife Phoebe who had uh, preceded him in death by a few years. Uh, his niece Mary Calvert continued on. Uh, she was the, uh, his personal assistant at Gerkes. Uh, she continued on and actually was responsible for getting those Milky Way photographs uh, finally uh, published, and I think that was done in 1927, so about four years after uh, Barnard died. But it's another uh, connection between Lick uh, and your is uh, through Barnard. Says uh, Gerard Kuiper, there's a brand new um, biography of him. Uh, well, not quite so new. It was published in 2015. Um, he was our uh, fourth director. He succeeded Otto Struve um, as director. He was also director of McDonald. Um, observatory, but of course Kuiper best known for uh, the naming of the Kuiper Belt, um, but uh, and the establishment of the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory in Tucson, uh, Arizona. Um, but he spent some time at Lick. He actually did um, some of his early work at Lick. Um, went out east and eventually landed. He was hired uh, by the University of Chicago and worked for a number of years uh, at Yerkes, rising to become the direct, the fourth director. Um, I believe the year was 1948. Uh, in those years, from 1932 until 1962, the director of Yerkes was also the director of the McDonald Observatory uh, in um, West Texas. And the way that that came about was very simply that Yerkes uh, and the University of Chicago was looking for a spot to do astronomy that was higher and drier uh, and uh, less cloudy uh, than Yerkes was. Uh, the University of Texas came uh, into possession of funds uh, from a banker, his last name was McDonald, 
upon his death in 1932 to build an observatory. The problem at UT was that the University of Texas did not have a Department of Astronomy. So the University of Chicago provided the Department of Astronomy. Uh, McDonald provided that great uh, facility in West Texas and uh, Kuiper made great use uh, of that. That's where he discovered um, uh, one of the satellites of Neptune, one of the uh, couple, one or at least one of the satellites of Uranus uh, was discovered there with the 82 inch telescope and many other things that he did. Um, so he bounced between Yerkes and McDonald uh, for a number of years, uh, but eventually landed at the Lunar and Planetary Lab uh, in Tucson. So uh, connection to Lick from the standpoint that uh, he had worked there as well. Otto Struve um, was our third director might know that he comes from a very storied family of astronomers. It goes back three generations, the Russians. Um, he was rescued uh, after the revolution in 1919 by um, uh, Edwin Brand Frost, our second director, brought uh, to the United States, made a staff astronomer at uh, Yerkes and eventually succeeded Frost uh, as our third director. Um, he doesn't have a, uh, a direct connection to Lick, but he did uh, go to Berkeley um, after he retired from, uh, or after he left Yerkes and uh, taught astronomy there uh, until his death. So um, it's another connection between that, that Wisconsin, um, yeah. California connection. Yes. I just wanted to mention that you've actually mentioned several EAS pe people have spoken to EAS. We had actually had Otto Struva speak to us a number of times. Uh, Don Osterbrock as well, and I believe Gerard, Gerard Kuiper, Kuiper spoke to EAS uh, a long time ago when he was here in the Bay Area. Well, very good. So there you have it. <laughs> and like I said, as a public historian, it's my job to, to try to make those connections for you so that you see um, where uh, your people, the people that you know, uh, where they may have uh, started out their careers or uh, the connection between our two observatories. So. Um, there's a much uh, stronger connection between Yerkes and Lick, I think, than, uh, than a lot of people realize. So, so this fellow, uh, Edwin Hubble, should be, um, it's a classic photo. I don't think, uh, we rarely see Hubble, a photo of Hubble without a pipe. Um, but uh, the reason he's thrown in there is because he was our graduate student uh, here in his PhD at Yerkes between 1915 and 1917. A um, little bit of a story with him, he never published, he did not publish his PhD thesis before leaving the University of Chicago. Um, it actually came out about two years after um, he left uh, the university. He was already working, uh, Hale hired him, uh, took him out to uh, Mount Wilson, and we know a lot about uh, his famous discoveries, his famous work there, uh, measuring the dimensions of um, the Milky Way and uh, figuring out that the Andromeda Nebula was actually the Andromeda Galaxy and uh, his work with Cepheid variables and so on. Um, so I threw this picture in just to, he's one of our famous alumni. Um, he worked actually with that 24 inch telescope in the South Dome. Uh, some of the original plates that he did are still in the vaults at, uh, at Gerke's. Um, a couple of them that I've uh, examined closely of uh, what we now call Hubble's Variable Nebula. And uh, so he studied that uh, extensively with the refractor and with the reflector and uh, wrote a very nice paper about it. His thesis, I must say, I've seen is about eight pages long and is actually quite unremarkable. Um, and uh, he was already using the little letters PhD after his name before his thesis was actually published and defended and all of that. Um, so he was called back to Chicago and informed that if he wanted to continue to use those letters PhD, he needed to publish his thesis. So he did so uh, and then hustled back to uh, California, not to be seen in Wisconsin again, to my knowledge, after that became such a celebrity in California that uh, he didn't need us uh, back at Yerkes. So uh, reason I threw him in. And then finally, our other famous uh, alumni at Yerkes is Carl Sagan. He uh, worked at Yerkes uh, between I might get the years wrong. It's either 1955 to 57 or 57 to 59, uh, but it was in the 1950s. Um, I was approached by producer, film producer, actually shortly before Yerkes closed. The year it closed was 2018, and I think that's when I was approached by film producer who wanted to do a story about um, uh, 
Carl Sagan and I believe it was, uh, I believe Ann Durian was his first wife. I, I think he was married a couple of times, um, but uh, he, about the romance uh, with her, uh, he met her at the University of Chicago and they spent a lot of time in Williams Bay uh, where the observatory is located. So he wanted to use the observatory interior and exterior shots. However, we were really not uh, able to accommodate that. And I'm not sure that that film project uh, is advancing anyway. Uh, so it probably didn't matter, but uh, we have a strong connection uh, with Carl Sagan. He's our other very famous alumnus uh, from Yerkes. And um, about the only connection that I can probably think of him with Northern California, I think he has something to do with SETI Institute, uh, founding it or working there um, not long after it was founded. So wanted Dan, to get a picture. And forgive picture me for interrupting again, but Carl Sagan was also a speaker to East Bay Astronomical Society before he became famous. So you have a <laughs> connection. Congratulations. Bingo. Yeah. Okay. So that's probably going to be the end of the connections that I'm going to make now because I want to turn back uh, towards Yerkes. So this is the official photograph of George Ellery Hale, and he is probably the fellow that I've spent the most time studying over the years. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about him, he was born and raised in Chicago. His father, William Ellery Hale, uh, and his, he had an uncle named George, George Brown Hale. Uh, those two brothers founded something called the Hale Elevator Company, which eventually was sold. Uh, and uh, today we know that that is the Otis Elevator Company. But the two brothers invented hydraulic elevators. So uh, George Ellery Hale grew up an industrialist family, grew up with money, um, and uh, was uh, basically a, a scion of, uh, uh, of Chicago. Um, but his, uh, unlike Yerkes, which who I'll talk about in a minute, who was uh, uh, rather unscrupulous uh, businessman, the Hales were very reputable people and very highly respected uh, in the city of Chicago. Today, you can still find evidence of them around. There's something called the Reliance Building on State Street downtown in Chicago is the, one of the first, very first skyscrapers. It's a 12 story building, first steel reinforced skyscraper that was built by the Hales. They were uh, land speculators. They owned a great deal of property on State Street. That's where uh, we eventually would find the department stores of Marshall Field and Carson Peary Scott um, and so on. They owned all the property uh, that many of those buildings were, were built on. So not only were they uh, builders of elevators, they were also uh, builders of real estate um, as well. So the Hales became very wealthy, and that is the type of environment that George Ellery Hale grew up in. He was the oldest of three children. Um, he was very much, I won't say he was spoiled by his father, um, but he was actually given many different opportunities than most kids his age in the 19th century uh, would have had. Um, he'd show an interest in tools or making, building something. His father would give him something to work on, and uh, he would please his father with some kind of project that he had done. His father in turn would reward him with more things, uh, more tools, uh, more uh, gadgets. Uh, got into uh, biology early, was studying pond water under microscopes and so on. At the age of 14, he discovered astronomy. He asked his father for a telescope. He got a four inch Clark refractor, which he set up in the third story of uh, the family mansion on the south side of Chicago. And that, the rest is history from there. That's the very first telescope that he had. Um, I got to meet his, uh, I've gotten to meet a number of uh, the Hale family members. Uh, we're now on fourth generation, fourth and fifth generation Hales. Um, he, he had two children. Uh, he had a son, uh, William, who was born in 1900. He had a daughter named Margaret, who was born in 1896. Margaret had six daughters um, and they settled in Medford, Oregon. The oldest of those daughters, Anne James, is someone that I spent a great deal of time with. Uh, she became the family historian. She died, unfortunately, just a few years ago uh, at the ripe old age of 97. There's something about the Hale women uh, that causes them to live an awful long time. George Ellery Hale's wife, Evelina Hale, uh, lived to be 99. She was born in 1868. It's pretty remarkable. She died in 1967 uh, in the Huntington Hotel in Pasadena where she had been living for a number of years. Um, and Ann James died uh, at the age of 95. That would be uh, her granddaughter. And even uh, Margaret Hale lived to be well into her 90s. So there's uh, some gene in that family uh, that is causing those women to live a long time. But that uh, was much to my 
uh, delight because I got to know uh, Anne quite well, so she's a family historian. After a couple of days of interviews with her uh, and learning more and more about the family uh, and helping interpret some of the letters that I had uh, run across uh, in archives, she handed me a four inch diameter piece of glass and she said, I want, you to, I want you to have this. And I said, what is it? She said, it's the lens from the four inch telescope that my grandfather originally got at the age of 14. So I actually happen to have that lens in my possession. I don't intend to keep it. Uh, permanently, it will eventually go into the Yerkes collection um, once the observatory reopens, but that was a tremendous gift uh, to me from um, Anne James. We had formed uh, quite a bond uh, in our interest of her grandfather. So uh, this, as I said, was the official portrait. He became the uh, observatory director of Yerkes at the ripe old age of 29. And uh, the story uh, of how he got to that point is, is rather interesting as well. It's the Kenwood Observatory, which his father built for him as a graduation gift. He graduated from MIT in 1890 with a degree in physics. Uh, he had already built him an astrophysical laboratory, which you see in the background there. This is on the family estate on the south side of Chicago. Uh, but that dome, uh, take a good look at it because you're going to see it again. That dome uh, came to rest on top of that north tower of Yerkes. This um, observatory did not last long. It was uh, disassembled after about seven years and all the equipment uh, was moved up uh, uh, to uh, up to Wisconsin. Um, this would be about, today that would be about a two hour drive uh, between the two locations, but it was a little bit uh, more difficult to get between the two uh, back in those days. And notice the design of the building. This was done by Burnham and Root, Daniel Burnham and John Root, uh, the two very famous Chicago architects designed this building uh, for him. So that is, uh, was a gift of his father. So you see um, how much bigger and bigger and bigger the gifts from William Ellery Hale uh, to George Ellery Hale became uh, over time. This, be, this came to the attention of another Chicagoan um, eventually, and that was uh, William Rennie Harper. He's the first president of the University of Chicago. He knew all about the Hales. He knew all about the Kenwood Observatory. And uh, the University of Chicago was opening its doors on October 1st, 1892. Uh, and uh, it was Harper's strong desire uh, to have um, great um, physical science programs. And at the heart of that, uh, he wanted a great telescope uh, as well for a department of astronomy. Um, the 12 inch uh, was something that he coveted. He asked William Ellery Hale many times uh, if he would consider donating the Kenwood Observatory to the University of Chicago. He spent a couple of years, as a matter of fact, uh, asking for that. Eventually, William Ellery Hale capitulated, but he asked, put one condition on, and that's that they needed to hire his son uh, and add him to the faculty. Uh, so actually, George Ellery Hale became a member of the faculty on July 1st, 1892. Um, interestingly enough, uh, his father had been supporting him after his graduation. He had gotten married, uh, as I mentioned, in 1890. He is, uh, uh, honeymoon was spent at Lick. Uh, he came back to Chicago, back to the Kenwood Observatory, was studying, you know, of course was well known for his solar research, but he was doing other work um, in astronomy as well. So uh, his father was supporting him and uh, they were doing quite nicely at that. Um, but William Ellery Hale decided that it was time for his son to have a bona fide job. For the next five years, from 1892 until 1897, uh, he did earn a salary from the University of Chicago, which was paid by William Ellery Hale. So he gave just enough money every year to the University of Chicago to pay George Ellery Hale's salary. Um, so that's how Kenwood became part of Yerkes. And uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, Harper is another whole story. Everything I'm talking about here, I could add another two hour presentation to because there's so much to talk about in this, in the history of Yerkes. But I will tell you, I'll leave you with a few things about uh, Harper uh, this way. Harper graduated from high school at the age of 10. Uh, he earned his undergraduate degree uh, in uh, languages at the age of 14 and his PhD just before his 19th birthday. He was a brilliant individual. Um, he was a ardent Baptist. Um, um, he taught and uh, studied the ancient languages of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Um, so he was a linguist, and uh, he also 
um, was heavily involved with the Baptist Church. That's how he got involved with uh, the University of Chicago. He, uh, U of C was originally founded as a Baptist University, had a very strong connection to one of the theological colleges outside the city of Chicago. Um, the university still today has a school of divinity, but is no longer uh, as strongly or, or uh, affiliated at all with the Baptist Church. But that uh, is just a little bit of information, um, uh, just a, a very small amount of information about Harper. Brilliant individual, he's very um, a strong supporter of the Yerkes Observatory. Unfortunately, uh, he developed pancreatic cancer uh, at the age of about 47. He died at the age of 49. Uh, at, in January of 1906. Charles Yerkes died three weeks before that. So three of the, uh, two of the three people that I often talk about and I work into my talks about Yerkes died within three uh, weeks of each other. Uh, Charles Yerkes died uh, on December 29th, uh, 1905 and um, Harper three weeks later uh, in January 1906. All of the uh, University of Chicago is due to the uh, founding um, money that was provided by John D. Rockefeller. Uh, remember this picture, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you something in, uh, in Yerke's architecture about him. So an ardent Baptist believed that uh, uh, his success in business uh, was due to his faith um, and uh, he was determined to found a Baptist university someplace in the United States. He thought he was gonna do it uh, in New York, but uh, people in Chicago, uh, trustees and alumni of the old University of Chicago, which had gone bankrupt in 1886, convinced uh, Rockefeller to refound the university and six years later opened the doors to the new University of Chicago, which continues in operation today. Um, but uh, it was Rockefeller who provided uh, the funding uh, to get the university started. So he's directly, uh, yeah, well, probably indirectly responsible for the founding of Yerkes as well. Without the University of Chicago, there would be no Yerkes Observatory. Um, here's Yerkes himself, and again, I could go on for hours about this fellow as well. He was known as the traction magnet, the titan uh, in Chicago. He um, operated and controlled all of the streetcar operations on the north and west sides of the city. He built the elevated rail system in Chicago, the thing we call the L today. It was not the first L. Uh, New York and, and Boston uh, had uh, elevated rail systems long before Chicago did. And actually, uh, Yerkes in the 1880s uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, poo-pooed the idea of having elevated rail in Chicago, but the congestion in the city by 1890 became uh, intolerable, and he needed a way uh, to get financing for that. He had such, he had a terrible reputation in Chicago. He was uh, uh, called the Boodler. Uh, there was another nickname that was affiliated with him. Uh, lots of political corruption in uh, surrounding Yerkes, um, uh, in uh, getting rights of way, uh, getting property uh, at cheap prices, getting his um, streetcar operations run up and down uh, streets that uh, he, uh, all, had, all he had to do was pay off some aldermen and uh, he was getting contracts left and right for uh, building his streetcar operations. He came to Chicago from Philadelphia, had been a stock and bond trader there. He got involved in a scandal involving Philadelphia city bonds and actually landed in jail for a couple of years. Um, so he's a convicted felon, but he had a lot of political connections in Philadelphia as well. He had some, some dirt on politicians and managed to use that to leverage himself out of prison. He lost his fortune uh, that he made in Philadelphia, but remade it uh, in Chicago. He's trying to do a couple of things. He's trying to get financing for the L. He's also trying to, to um, rectify his image uh, through the donation uh, of the Yerkes Observatory. So does this fellow for whom Yerkes uh, is named, the Charles Tyson Yerkes in an era when everybody seems to have three names. Um, so he was Charles Tyson Yerkes Jr. Uh, as a matter of fact. And so his father was Charles Tyson Yerkes and he had a son named Charles Yerkes. And it is his son's uh, relatives, his uh, descendants uh, that we are working with today um, uh, who, are, who are part of the project today. They've. Uh, Many of them have come back into the picture. Um, interesting thing that I don't want to forget to mention, so I'm going to mention it now. On October 21st, 1897, when he threw the keys to the University of Chicago uh, to the, from the observatory, uh, he was uh, the contractor for the project. He owned the observatory, and uh, he made the donation on October 21st, 1897. 
in a one page uh, handwritten document, which became a reversionary document, it stated, and um, it was uh, dated that October 21st, 1897, signed by him. Uh, I recognize this, I would recognize the signature anywhere. Um, stated that if the University of Chicago ever stopped using uh, the observatory for astronomical research, that the building and the telescope would revert to him or his heirs. That reversionary document actually came into play uh, nearly 125 years later. Uh, many of us were stunned. I thought I had seen every document there was to see having to do with Yerkes. Turns out I was always looking and I was looking in the wrong set of archives at the University of Chicago. That document resided with the secretary's papers. I've gone through uh, the Yerkes archives, the observatory archives, and the president's papers, uh, but never thought to look through the papers for the secretary. Uh, it turns out that the university knew about that document way back in the 1960s uh, and had kind of kept it secret, but when the university decided to close the observatory, uh, that document uh, was invoked and uh, that again, it became um, uh, a live uh, issue again. Now, if the observatory had been built 10 miles farther south in the state of Illinois, because uh, we, we reside, that observatory resides just 10 miles inside the state of Wisconsin, everything would have been very different because that uh, document would have expired um, by uh, this time. But in the state of Wisconsin, they live forever. Um, so there was uh, that little issue. And of course, the relatives had to get involved in that because they owned, technically, if the observatory stopped being used for research purposes, they owned it and they owned uh, the 40 inch refractor as well. The problem with that is they did not own the property that the observatory was built on. That was a separate donation by a fellow named John Johnston Jr., um, a, um, an attorney and real estate speculator in the Geneva Lake area where the observatory is built. Um, so that wraps up uh, another whole can of worms uh, as well. So one of the reasons why it's taken so long for things to get unraveled and things to uh, get smoothed out with the transition between the university and the new foundation that has taken over the uh, observatory uh, has to do somewhat uh, with that reversionary document. This is a very famous cutaway diagram as done by Warner and Swayze uh, of the Big Dome and you can see exactly how um, it all works. There's the 40 inch refractor standing on its pedestal on a concrete and brick base uh, that goes some distance down into the ground. From the base to the top of um, from the base of the telescope to the top of the declination axis is 65 feet. That tube is 64 feet in length. The focal length of the telescope is 63.51 feet. It is actually not the longest focal length telescope in the world. There's one called the Canon that some of you may be familiar with in Berlin. That's a 20 inch diameter uh, refractor that has just a slightly longer focal length uh, than the Yerkes refractor. So, I can claim that this is the largest uh, refracting telescope in the world. I cannot claim that it is the longest focal length uh, refractor in the world because the one in Berlin is slightly, um, slightly longer. At about uh, just above the brick base there, you see the elevator floor. This is, a, and I know that Lick has one as well. Uh, Lick's, I believe, is hydraulic. Uh, this one is counterbalanced. If you look to the left and the right, You'll see some, um, they look like towers on the left and the right. Those are the wake towers. There's four of them uh, that are spaced 90 degrees apart. Uh, there are stacks of approximately uh, 12 tons of weight in each of those, so about 48 tons. That floor weighs 37 and a half tons. It moves through a distance of 26 feet. Uh, and of course, those of you who know Lick understand exactly why you need an elevator floor with a long, focal length refractor, you have to try to reach the back end of the telescope in order to do something with it uh, when it's pointed in different parts of the sky. So uh, that is a, a, that floor is 75 feet in diameter, weighs 37 and a half tons, rises through a distance of 26 feet. Uh, it is technically, and we oftentimes say this technically, the world's largest indoor elevator. Uh, an outdoor elevator, a bigger one, might be one that you would find on an aircraft carrier uh, to move planes up and down, but uh, this would be the largest one that's enclosed inside a building. All right. Um, another point of order uh, with the refractor, it was on display without the lenses at the Columbian Exposition in 1893. Uh, this is the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building uh, in Jackson Park in Chicago. 
Um, the telescope did not go on display until about the middle of August. Uh, Warner and Swayze were still working on it at the time uh, that the fair opened on May 1st. By the way, that's Shelburne Burnham who's standing uh, at the very top um, uh, of the t uh, just underneath the um, uh, the uh, underneath the declination axis there, um, and who's posing for the picture. The Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building was the largest building ever built at that time. It covered 45 acres. And uh, the telescope sat at the north end of what was called Columbia Avenue. And uh, so it was on display from August until the fair closed on October 31st of uh, 1897. It didn't matter so much uh, that, it, that it, the exhibit opened late because a lot of people came to the fair in May and early June, and then attendance started to fall off. As the summer progressed and it got closer and closer to the closing, the numbers uh, started to swell. I estimate from numbers that I've seen published every week in Scientific American um, that about if, if everybody passed through this building, which they probably did, uh, who came to the fair because the building was so large and there were so many other exhibits in this building, I estimate that 17 million people, 27 million people came to the fair, 17 million of them after the opening of this exhibit. Uh, you couple that with the fact that we, uh, uh, the observatory is located only about two hours uh, from Chicago. Uh, the Yerkes Refractor then becomes the world's most visited, most seen telescope uh, of all time. And of course, that's greatly helped by the fact uh, that 17 million people saw it uh, at the fair, but it was a, a great attraction there. Again, the lenses were, were uh, not quite finished uh, at this point in time, so it was just the steel structure of the instrument on display. It was disassembled and stored in this building, whereby one of the first calamities that nearly befell the telescope happened in January of 1894. This building caught on fire. Um, and the bill, the uh, teles uh, fortunately, the, the fire started on the south end of the building and the thing was so big that uh, they managed to get the fire, firefighters managed to get the fire out before it reached the telescope. Eventually the telescope was moved and I refer to these as the lost years, about two and a half years. I have absolutely no idea. I've never been able to figure out exactly where that telescope was stored until it was finally brought up to Williams Bay to be reassembled. The base, the pier, those sections uh, eventually found their way to the site of the construction for the observatory in 1894. Construction didn't begin until May of 1895. Um, we are now, the reason for the, uh, my talk, Yerkes at 125, is uh, this year was, uh, is, was the 125th anniversary of groundbreaking. So we are inside now um, the 125 year anniversary period uh, this year, next year, and then 2022 uh, would be the 125th anniversary uh, of its dedication. So that's the Columbian Exposition, 1893. Construction began, like I mentioned, 1895, May 1st. Notice the dog in this picture. Um, we believe most of these photos, unfortunately, many of them are not credited to a photographer. We believe that this is, uh, this picture was taken by George Ellery Hale. He had a dog named Sirius. Of course, you would know why a dog would be named Sirius. It's Sirius is the dog star. And that dog appears in many of the pictures uh, of construction of the observatory. So we're pretty sure that it was uh, Hale who took these uh, pictures. But there you can see the walls of the big dome going up. Uh, here you can see um, the dome going on. This would be 1896 uh, during the summer. That was a wood clad dome covered with um, tin. That dome lasted until 1975, was replaced with turnplate steel, uh, stainless steel inside, turnplate on the outside. Um, there is a lot of talk right now of replacing that dome again. Um, it's gonna be very expensive. When it was done in 1975, a woman's group in Chicago raised the money, it was $100,000, which doesn't seem like very much money for a 90-foot dome, uh, but that was $1975, and we can just imagine how much it's gonna cost uh, to replace it now in uh, the 2020s, so in the 21st century. But there we are on the top um, of the uh, roof looking, uh, we're looking west there. And uh, about 200 men in total were responsible for the building of Yerkes. Here, some of them took some time out this is on the south side um, to uh, pose for the picture. And uh, this photo was taken the very last day when the, when the dome was finished. Um, I can't imagine being on those uh, uh, scaffolds uh, way up at the very top. 
I've never been at the top of that dome. A few people have, uh, but it's not exactly a place uh, <laughs> that I really want to hang out. Um, there's a really nice um, balcony all the way around the outside um, that you get a tremendous view of Geneva Lake from up there and the surrounding area. The uh, hill that that uh, observatory is built on, uh, for those of you in California, this is going to sound very funny. Uh, this is one of the highest points in the entire area uh, in southern Wisconsin. It's 1,100 feet above sea level, which is one of the reasons why that spot was chosen uh, for a placement of the observatories. Uh, it's about as high as you get um, in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we have a beautiful state here. We have lakes, we have rivers, we have forests, we have farmland. Um, we have the Great Lakes, we have all of that stuff. Unfortunately, the one thing that, that Wisconsin lacks are mountains. Uh, we have snow, we have, you know, if you want, you want warm weather, you can have that. If you want cold weather, you can have that. Um, but we just simply do not have mountains. We don't have a place uh, to put an observatory uh, at elevation. And this is one of the final pictures that was taken. This is at the close of 1897 after the dedication. And remember I said the, uh, you would remember the Kenwood Dome, well, there it is on the North Tower. Um, and uh, that was where the Kenwood uh, refractor was reassembled. One of the uh, very interesting features of, uh, and, and one of the things that attracts people to um, Yerkes is the architecture. There's a lot of terracotta on this building, and there you get to see a little bit of it. This is on the South Dome, and you see the first quarter moon there. This picture was taken by my friend and colleague, Richard Dreiser. Inside, this is the old, an old photo. Uh, during the dedication time of the rotunda. Uh, that's looking up the great staircase that leads to the uh, refractor. Uh, the room on the left, um, you see the, the glass uh, door there, uh, was um, uh, used as an, uh, as an office. It has um, pocket doors on the right-hand side. You can't see them in this picture that uh, out onto the hallway. That became my, um, uh, my gift shop. Uh, in uh, 2016, I think, was when we started working on that. Spent $15,000 uh, renovating that uh, entire space. Um, Ed Struble, who's taken care of the observatory for the last 30 years, I designed the, the gift shop. He built it for me. Um, we purchased the materials. Thought it would take about a year uh, to make that money back. We actually uh, paid for that in two months. Um, once that gift shop opened, we never looked back. Uh, and our, our numbers had, uh, visitors' numbers had swelled uh, by that time as well. So uh, Yerkes became a very, very popular place uh, to visit. And uh, over the last uh, few years of our, the existence of our tours, and this is where the tours always started, is right in the rotunda. This is another spot where we had weddings. Um, corporate receptions were held here uh, in the rotunda as well. So as main focal point, it's the linchpin uh, to find your way all the way around the building. Uh, is right here. This is where you would start. Very famous picture of the refractor. You will find this in virtually every textbook um, that's ever been published about astronomy since the uh, building, uh, since the dedication of the observatory. Um, you'll see this picture. And uh, many times uh, we've reproduced this picture and sold it in our gift shop uh, as well. But this is right at the time, uh, right after dedication. And there you see the wood floor, the uh, elevator floor inside the dome and you get a really good uh, image uh, of uh, the refractor here. Basically the relic uh, the Yerkes refractor is just a scaled up version of the Lick refractor. You guys will probably notice an awful lot of similarity uh, between those two instruments. Yeah, nice side view of it. It's a Rumford spectrograph uh, which was used by Hale and many other astronomers uh, that's attached to the telescope. That's a, a classic picture you oftentimes see uh, the Rumford spectrograph attached uh, to the instrument. So I talked about that elevator floor. There you see it intact. What delayed our uh, dedication, it should have taken place in July of 1897. Um, off on the left-hand side of this picture, you'll see the uh, tower, uh, the weight tower. Those weights became detached from the floor. It turns out that Warner and Swayze made a little bit of a miscalculation on how to attach those weights uh, at the four points around the floor. Um, shortly after the observatory, uh, the, the lenses were installed by uh, the Clarks and uh, by uh, Alvin Graham Clark uh, and Carl and Dean. Um, and they had left. Uh, the floor crashed uh, a couple of days, well, about a week uh, after that. 
And it's interesting, it was not the first time the floor had been used. The floor had been actually used to elevate the sections of the tube into place during the winter of 1896. So it had made many, many trips up and down that 26 foot um, uh, distance. But for some reason, um, on May 29th, 1897, in the morning after uh, Edward Barnard had gotten done using it, he had left, gone home, um, the floor crashed at about 6 a.m. Uh, that Saturday morning. And uh, this is what Hale and his staff uh, came into. So that set things back. It took two months uh, to reconstruct that. Most of the, most of the lumber, most of the flooring was um, uh, salvageable and today is still in place, but the structural steel was pretty well destroyed um, and had to be replaced. Warner and Swayze paid the entire bill uh, to have that floor put back in place, but unfortunately that delayed the uh, dedication to October 21st, 1897, and uh, many of the people who had planned on visiting, many of the professional astronomers who had planned on coming to the observatory for the dedication couldn't in October. Many of them were teaching and uh, they were busy, um, so they were unable to attend uh, a later uh, fall dedication, but uh, the dedication nonetheless uh, did take place. And here is a picture. This is actually uh, an important shot because this is the uh, considered the founding uh, of the, the kernel of founding of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, it's another thing that Hale is responsible uh, for uh, doing. He founded the Astrophysical Journal uh, in 1895 and uh, the very first formation meeting of the American Astronomical Society occurred about a year after this picture was taken uh, at Yerkes. Um, but these are the many of the astronomers and the dignitaries uh, in the astronomical world who were um, present for the dedication. And notice that the grounds are completely unfinished. Yerkes, Charles Yerkes had no intention after paying $400,000 uh, to um, construct the observatory and the telescope of uh, doing anything with the grounds. Uh, the grounds would stay that way until about 1910 um, when Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Uh, was hired to do the landscape plan for the University of Chicago. So much of that landscape plan still uh, exists at the observatory. And there we have another shot um, sometime after dedication. And you can see that the South Dome is now uh, in place as well. So this picture would be dated in 1898. Uh, Helios, the sun god, uh, is featured prominently over both of the um, entrances. I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but this is actually one of my favorite terracotta details uh, and extraordinarily important uh, to uh, the history of Yerkes because it was a solar research facility for many years. It was uh, used first by Hale and then by a number of other astronomers for solar research, the refractor was. So you can see uh, Helios, the sun god, some people call him Apollo, of course, uh, and his four horses and his chariot carrying the sun across the sky. Um, so you see that over the entrances to the observatory. A um, couple of other details. The, uh, this famous uh, image that is seen on the columns of the observatory, man with a long nose being stung by a bee, is actually Rockefeller. So let me flip back and forth. You'll see some resemblance there. Um, so it's a little bit of a trick that's played on Rockefeller. And that bee is signified by Harper, who uh, managed to finagle, well, he didn't live long enough to get it all, but Harper, uh, Rockefeller eventually donated $40 million to uh, fund and can keep the operations of the University of Chicago going during lean times. You also see um, Harper's face in the columns there. There he is off on the right. We're holding a picture next to it so that you can see and uh, then we'll also see Yerkes, there's Yerkes, and we'll also see him in the Seder faces that overlook the doorways. There's two on each side of, of the doors front and back. Um, so you will see uh, him there as well. And um, half man, half beast, and they were considered to, in, in mythological lore, uh, to frolic in the woods, be promiscuous, and not be responsible for their actions, which very much describes the founder of our observatory. Uh, the Griffins, there are five of them that are this size overlooking all the entrances uh, to the observatory holding the Yerkes shield. Um, there are small ones that are at the, at the tops of the columns uh, underneath the, uh, the big arch as well. 
is a shot of the 24 inch telescope that um, Richie built. As I mentioned, this is the many great grandfather, many great, great, great grandfather of all the big reflecting telescopes. This is the telescope that Hubble used uh, and many other astronomers uh, over the years. Um, that you guys should recognize. Do you know where it is? Dave, do you know where that telescope is today? Forgive me, it looks familiar. Um, I can't quite place yeah, it. Yeah, it should because it's that Chabot. What? Yep, you have it. Explain, please. It should be on display at Chabot. It was there the last time I was there. You have it on, uh, you have an exhibit of um, American equipment. We, we did. Um, Maybe it's not there anymore. I don't think it's. That explains why it's familiar, but yeah, I don't think it's there now. And well, yeah, okay. that, exhi that exhibit is long gone. But okay, I, well, I it used I to be on this. display at Chabot. I don't know what Chabot did it, with it. It could but... be in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> so there you guys go. I had actually, I had completely forgotten about that until I looked at that picture, and I'm like, okay, that telescope's at Chabot. Actually, yeah, now, I, now that you mentioned it, I do remember it being at, at, uh, on display. Thank you, Dan. Uh, forgive me, uh, as I get older, my memory goes. Well, so did mine until I looked at the picture and I went, oh, there's one more connection to you guys. Our reflector at Yerkes is, is in your building. Someplace, I'm assuming, unless, unless Chabot gave it away. Yeah, don't tell them we lost it. Um, you know what? If they don't want it, I'll take it back because <laughs> I would love to have this instrument. Um, you guys probably don't realize that Hubble used this telescope to earn his PhD. So uh, maybe you should put it back on display. Uh, the 60-inch mirror for Ma Wilson was ground and polished at uh, Yerkes in the basement. There it is. Um, it was shipped out to California. That particular telescope was supposed to be mounted, and uh, the 60-inch was supposed to be built at Yerkes, but the University of Chicago couldn't come up with the funding. By that time, uh, Charles Tyson Yerkes was gone um, and completely out of the picture, so uh, he was not around to fund it. Uh, so it landed uh, at Mount Wilson, but uh, that's the one that got away from us. Uh, that 60 inch telescope uh, should have been um, built at Yerkes. We've had a few famous visitors over the years, and this is the most sought after and most uh, purchased photograph at Yerkes. And uh, close to center right there, you'll see Albert Einstein. To his right is Edwin Brandt Frost. And just a little bit farther to his right, you'll see Barnard. Uh, there, but that was the staff of the observatory um, at the time uh, that uh, uh, Einstein visited. Now, this is another interesting story from the standpoint that um, this is kind of like Elvis, who seems to come and go, and Elvis was here and he appears in different places. There's a lot of lore about around the lake that um, I've had people come up to me after tours and say, Oh, my grandfather remembers seeing Albert Einstein in a, in a, um, restaurant uh, every Saturday um, in uh, the city of Lake Geneva. And I said, well, that would be slightly impossible because he actually lived in Princeton. And to my knowledge, he never came back to Williams Bay after this visit. The reason that, and this is very poorly understood, the reason why uh, Einstein came to Yerkes, the uh, legend goes that he wanted, this is his first visit to the US, by the way. So this was in 19 May 6, 1921. Uh, and he earned, um, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921, but it was given to him in 1922. So he didn't yet have it at the time uh, that this picture was taken, but his fame uh, was already pretty much uh, well known at that point. Um, the University of Chicago was after him to join the faculty. They wanted him either as a professor of physics or a professor of mathematics. In the 1930s, Princeton got him. Uh, instead, he was not ready uh, to move to the United States. He did do some guest lecturing uh, for George Ellery Hale at uh, Caltech uh, in 1922. So he did come back to the U.S. and he spent the winter uh, in Southern California. Um, but this is a very famous photograph. And we have recreated this picture many times and uh, photoshopped Einstein in. So you'll see a different group of people. Uh, our staff has done it. Um, I've had weddings. Uh, do it and uh, always leave a space for Einstein uh, to be photoshopped into the picture. Um, I have, I became an expert on getting the telescope into the right position, getting the floor elevated. The floor is at its maximum height here, turning the dome um, 
the proper position using the doors and windows uh, as markers um, and getting people lined up. So I can't tell you how many times I've reproduced that picture uh, in, in modern times, but very famous photograph. And he is probably our most famous visitor. Um, Dan, for, forgive me. I have to also say that Einstein also visited the old Chabot and EAS. So bingo once again. <laughs> there we go. We keep finding all those connections. Uh, this is William Wilson Morgan, Bill Morgan, who became our observatory director uh, in 1963. Bill came to the University of Chicago as a young man, and he stayed his entire career. He worked 65 years at Yerkes. And here is a famous photograph taking the 10,000 spectrograph of the sun with the Rumford spectrograph. Um, Morgan may not be uh, a common household name among astronomers, but he is responsible for discovering the spiral structure of the Milky Way galaxy uh, with the re refractor. I was going to do an exhibit at Yerkes a couple of years ago, three years ago, I think it was. Um, I was looking for the paper that he wrote. Uh, Kyle Cudworth, who's a longtime astronomer um, and good friend of mine at Yerkes, uh, Kyle studied globular clusters uh, for most of his uh, professional career. Uh, I approached him one day and I said, um, whatever happened to Morgan's paper? I'm, I'm assuming it's in uh, the APJ in the Ast Astrophysical Journal. And he said, no, actually it never got published. There's a three page paper or a three page article that you'll find in, I don't know, a 1953 or 54 issue of Sky and Telescope where he makes the announcement and that's it. Um, uh, Morgan never carried that project any farther forward. He used graduate students to help him do the work, but what they did was uh, uh, took spectra of um, all the bright, well, the blue stars uh, in the northern part uh, of the Milky Way galaxy and discerned uh, the spiral structure of the galaxy from that. And they only did it with the northern hemisphere. In the 1980s, another person did it in the southern hemisphere uh, to basically complete that project. Um, but uh, that's what Morgan, and it's, there's the Morgan Keenan um, spectral atlas, um, uh, stellar classification atlas um, that uh, also bears his name as well. So uh, Morgan, very famous astronomer, Ed Gierke's, and again, as I mentioned, uh, worked nearly seven decades um, at the observatory. Hale left, uh, left us in 1903. I uh, was gonna establish Yerkes West, as he called it at that time on Mount Wilson. Uh, essentially, he loved Pasadena, loved Southern California, uh, and he never came back. Uh, he left his position as director at Yerkes in 1905, and there he is doing um, some expeditionary work uh, on Mount Wilson, and of course, you guys, are very well familiar uh, with the observatory um, out there in uh, Southern California. And there he is in his office. Uh, this is an official photograph um, office at uh, Mount Wilson. Uh, the 60 inch telescope, the one that should have been uh, Ed Yerkes, uh, that has a tie in to the San Francisco area. That uh, steel structure was all done by Union Steel uh, in San Francisco and survived, was being built in 1906, survived the earthquake and the fire. Uh, in San Francisco as well. So uh, a little bit of trivia on that telescope too. And then the 100 inch uh, followed. So the Yerkes refractor was succeeded as the world's largest telescope by this one, the 60 inch, which was succeeded by this one um, as the world's largest uh, telescope, the 100 inch, and which was succeeded by the 200 inch telescope known as the Hale uh, reflector um, in succession, George Ellery Hale was the father of the four largest telescopes in the world, starting with the Yerkes refractor. Uh, and that is a feat that I think I can safely say will never be accomplished by another human being. Yeah. And a couple final photographs for you here. Uh, that is Kyle Cudworth, way, uh, young Kyle Cudworth, way down uh, at the bottom of the refractor. That's basically what it looks like today. The, um, the plan is to restore the refractor to more of a 19th century appearance. There's an awful lot of brass uh, fittings and fixtures on the telescope that have all been painted over. Uh, the plan is to remove all of that paint, start all over again. Um, and uh, the, a lot of the old hardware uh, for the uh, slow motion controls and right ascension declination, the clamps, uh, all of that original hardware, which used to be on the uh, back end, the IP center of the telescope, uh, is still in the basement and can be brought back uh, and restored, so that's uh, uh, the plan at this point. In an aerial shot, this is an older picture uh, of um, the observatory. 
Uh, there you get to see the North Tower, the South Tower uh, with their new domes. Those are new ash domes that were uh, installed in 2002. The original domes were steel. Uh, both of those survived eight, uh, the end of the 19th century all the way through the 20th century up until 2002. Um, and that's uh, essentially the way the grounds look today. So that's it. That is my presentation. And from, oh. with that, I'll take some questions. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Let me get my video on. All right. I mean, why don't you uh, stop sharing your screen so we could uh, go back and forth and see our talking heads. There we Rich, go. Can I can just go make one more comment? Yeah, yeah, please. I made this. Um, forgive me for interrupting, but uh, Alan, um, Alan Roach pointed out that the Smithsonian has taken back the telescope that uh, Dan was referring to. So, well, well, you get to fight with your wife when you get home because she says it's either under the 20 inch or in the storage unit. <laughs> <laughs> so you let us know how it all works out. <laughs> um, we do well, my a... hope is, my, uh, uh, Rich, my hope is that uh, you guys all learn something. Tonight. Oh, my God, yes. I, you're you're going to be, uh, you already are an excellent historian, Dan, and uh, I can't wait yeah. for your book. I really can't. This yeah. was just Well, I can't either it's because you know what? It, it's been in the works for 25 years. Yeah, so, so it's, uh, it's, it's time. It's, it's about time. time that it comes <laughs> out, yes. Uh, yeah. I, I need to sit in this office here and actually put pen to paper. And um, just so that everybody who's watching so that you know, the Yerkes Observatory does have a new website. It's yerkesobservatory.org. So Yerkes Observatory, all run together, .org. Uh, and you'll find um, snippets of my book, uh, what's been, uh, what I've written so far, you'll find snippets of it out there. Um, I'm testing um, a few different uh, formats and testing some verbiage and so on. Um, I always appreciate feedback on that, but I was asked by the Yerkes Future Foundation, which has taken over control of the observatory, uh, to start building the website for them. So I was the person that they came to, lucky me. And um, so you're going to see, you're going to start seeing some of my book. I'm not going to put right. the whole thing out there, you know, obviously, but I will put uh, portions of it out there so you guys can read it. Well, I guarantee you there will be a copy here at the Chabot Library. Okay. So, well, I appreciate that. That's up one sold. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I know two, because I'll have one as yeah. well. And my, right. I have two oh, yeah. kids, and they both said that and, they will and, buy it. Oh, good. And Dave, you'll probably buy a copy. I, oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, it was, a, it was a great presentation, and I love the fact that you, you entered in at least five visitors to the East Bay Astronomical Society in your talk. Yeah. Well, as I said, it, it's a public historian's mm -hmm. job to make, it rele to make history relevant to uh, his or her listener or uh, the exhibits that they produce and so on. So uh, this was a completely different program than what I would normally do. Uh, but I did this for you guys because uh, it occurred to me a couple of weeks ago, hey, there's an awful lot of tie in between. I remembered the article from Sky and Telescope about the Wisconsin California axis. And I just kind of took, uh, took off on that. And it even surprised me how many, how many things I could tie into Northern California. Uh I, I just want to make two more comments uh, that are rather charming here. First, uh, just a matter of coincidence, if it wasn't for COVID in two weeks, uh, we, we would have been observing through the 60-inch telescope that was snatched from you folks, uh, sadly. Uh, yes. We had just well, planned on doing that on September 19th, two weeks from now. Uh, but hopefully after COVID, we we're going to do this. And it's a spectacular instrument to look through. And it's amazing to, to go down into the the basement below there and look at the lockers with the names of people like uh, uh now is it the 60 or the 100 that you're going to view with we were going to go to the 60. the 60. Okay. it's, it's about you could do yeah. both yeah yeah we've done both I, I still like the 60. i like being able to climb on the telescope yeah i did that uh <laughs> just so that you know i did that exactly two years ago this month it was one of the last things i had uh, i had some major surgery done at the end of september 2018 i took some uh, medical leave um, I didn't want to be around when the observatory was closing because um, it was um, obviously uh, suffering from a broken heart um, with what happened there. But um, just before um, I went on medical leave, uh, Scott Roberts put it put together actually uh, yes. an expedition. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Uh, Very yeah. well. Yeah, and uh, in fact, Claude Plymate was there um, for that. So we had a small group of I don't know twenty or twenty five people, something like that. Um, I was presented with that Astronomical Outreach Award um, that night uh, there for my work with the 40-inch refractor, and uh, we had just a tremendous night. It was spectacular. 
Um, so I'm sorry you didn't get to do it, but you will get to do it, I'm sure. Yeah. It'll I'm come sorry. back around. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, we do have one question. Um, Go ahead. Not a, lot of, not a lot of questions. Somebody was asking uh, whether the absorption tube and the spectroscopy uh, equipment is still at the observatory or attached to anything? Or? That, and that uh, is an excellent question. And uh, underneath that 75 foot floor, uh, there's a lot of stuff. It's a common affliction. <laughs> talk about a basement, you know, uh, a collection point for, for stuff. Um, the, the, uh, um, what do we call, I can't, we used to have a name for that. I can't remember what it is. Anyway, we'll say it, um, usually we'll say it's under the floor. Yeah. Um, so if you say it's under the floor, that means the big tower. And um, Ed Struble, who's a very good friend of mine, who has taken care of the observatory for the last 30 years, and I um, have looked for that. Unfortunately, I don't think it exists anymore. And it, and it really is a sad, it's a great question. That's too bad. And, we, have and, a, we have a similar saying here, uh, you know, if we can't find something, we all say, oh, it must be under Rachel's dome. Yeah, and, okay. uh, and then, you know, we go down there and we, we look around and we, you know, can't find it and, you know, move on. All right, so was that the only question? I th that was the only question, unless, uh, oh, is the clock drive on the, uh, on the uh, large ref ref refractor uh, still uh, the original equipment or what's the now, story that? Um, you guys all know about that, you know, what is that weight drive thing that goes back and yeah, forth? The, yeah, yeah we, have, we have a couple of those ourselves, but they're yeah, not. Yeah, and, and the lick, ref lick refractor would have, been, um, would have been controlled at one point, at least that way. Um, here's the deal. The um, the universe, um, the observatory, uh, and actually this is this is another good point. Uh, Yerkes was the first electrified observatory. Um, we had our own powerhouse, uh, coal fired with two uh, forty horse generators, and also produced steam and hot water uh, for the homes um, and for the observatory and electricity for all of them. It was this little island of uh, power in the middle of um, a rural area in Wisconsin that had no electricity uh, in the 19th century. So we had this little cluster of buildings that had electricity. Um, within the first two years of operation of uh, the telescope of the observatory, all of the original clock drive mechanism was removed and that became an electric, uh, electrically operated uh, telescope. Um, which brings up another point I, hadn't, I had forgotten about. The original motors, um, they are Siemens and Halsky, today we know that as okay. Siemens Corporation, Siemens and Halsky direct current motors that run the dome and the telescope are still operating all wow. these years later. Now in 1940, alternating current was brought in uh, to replace the DC current system. You will still find DC switches and DC wiring all over that building. Yeah. Um, but there is a, I don't know, I'll call it a transformer board uh, in the, under the floor. Um, that converts all of that, uh, um, uh, all of that power to alternating current and, and operates everything by AC uh, now. But uh, another great question, uh, but now um, it was not, the telescope was weight driven uh, for the first two years after that, uh, it was electrically driven. And since then things have been changed. There is no plan to go back in that direction, uh, but there is a plan to upgrade all the electronics on the telescope. All right. Well, thank you. We're kind of at our hard stop for tonight. Yeah, I figured. We have to, I haven't we have to, been we have to get time. to our next uh, presentation. It's like wall to wall tonight. Saturday nights let are me, real busy. Let me just make so. a plug for next uh, month. Oh, yeah. Speaker. Go ahead. Uh, Saturday, October 10th, we're going to be having George Leopold, and he'll be speaking about the supersonic life and times of Gus Grissom. And I am done. Thank you very much. All right. Well, Dan, thank you so much. It was a pleasure seeing you tonight. And, thank you. Uh, you too. I wish you the best of luck uh, with your book and, uh, and your future involvement at Yerkes. Really look forward to it. Yeah, I did. The, the future involvement is a little uncertain right now, but, yeah, I, but I'm hoping that that's, uh, that, that'll eventually work out. Well, so. I'll hope for the best. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all. I appreciate your patience with me tonight, and uh, it was a great pleasure to talk to all of you. All right. You take care now. All right. Goodbye. Thank you all for attending.